They're the cool water on a summer day. The laughter and the surprises of life. A seed, when planted, will rise up and blossom, exploding into a million colors of love. We lose ourselves in everyday life, and they remind us what matters. Pure joy, pure relief. That's our. Get down from there! That was a hard one. Hey, good morning, New Anthem Church. How are we doing this morning? Amen. Come on, can we give Jesus some praise today? We're so glad that you're here. We know we have some new guests in the room this morning, and we just want to say this. Wherever you are from, whatever walk of life you may be from, we want to say you are welcome here. You're not just amongst friends here in New Anthem. You're amongst family. We're so glad you're in the house today. We want to welcome not just our first-time guests that may be in the room, but also everyone tuned in right now watching by way of Facebook and YouTube. Come on, can we welcome our online audience? Hey, right now, if you're tuned in, let us know where you're watching from, and go ahead and put new right in the comment section, either below or to the right of your screen. It's a great way to connect to our church, and whether you are in the room or tuned in, we'd love you to fill out a connect card digitally or physically, and it's a great way. Again, we're not supposed to go through life alone. We're not created to do life alone. We were created to do better with other people, and so uh, we would love you to just connect to the heart of our church, uh, and if you are new, we'd love to just uh, give you, reach out to you, give you a simple phone call, find out what your prayer needs are and how we can best serve you as a church. That would be amazing. I mean, there's so many uh, awesome things to be excited about and encouraged about in the life of our church. Uh, we actually had 35, almost, I think around 40 new families last week for Relaunch Sunday and 11 salvations, first time decisions for Jesus. It's amazing. We're excited about that, and uh, again, there's so much to celebrate. We moved on in our week into a little thing called Night of Worship. Was anyone there for Night of Worship? Wasn't that awesome? The people of God coming together, the people of Jesus coming together to just celebrate him. We had over six churches. I think we had closer to seven or eight churches there. All I know is I kept meeting people, and I'd ask them what church they were from if I didn't know who they were. And they would tell me, like, I, I talked to one guy. He's like, he said this really long church name. It was like Church Bar Bartholomew, St. Luke's Generation for All Saints. And I'm like, what is, th I don't even think that's in uh, Michigan, let alone Mount Clemens. But welcome, and we're really glad you're here. And here's the truth today. We're going to continue to do events like this. This wasn't just kind of one, some one-off gimmick event. We bring the churches together. We truly believe that revival is going to happen in the city, not by New Anthem Church getting big, but by all the churches of God, setting aside denominational differences and realizing that there's a lot more that should unite us called Jesus than what divides us. Amen? And so... Man, keep, keep a lookout. We're going to keep doing stuff. We're going to keep partnering with other churches for better, for worse. And uh, we believe we're going to see revival and God's going to honor that as well. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to say before we jump into the word of God today is, man, make plans to be there for midweek. Here's all you need to know when you're like, man, what is midweek about? It's about two things, worship and the word. Worship and the word. We're going to go to a deep place of worship. We're going to strip things down. It's not going to be like worship here. Again, it's going to be at the upper room just down from our new offices downtown. And uh, we're, we're going to just do some acoustic worship. And then we're going to dive into the word of God deeply. But it's not really going to be in a preaching format as much as it's going to be in more of a classroom format. You will learn new things about your faith and about the God of the universe if you come. That is what I can promise you. And so I want to make uh, make plans to be there. It's just eight weeks. It's not this huge... Uh, uh, you know, you got to rearrange your life and just plan on being there every single Thursday. We're just going to run it for eight weeks, and we believe it's going to encourage your faith. Um, I'm really excited because we're jumping into a brand new three-week series called Reaction. You saw that video. I absolutely love that video uh, because it, it kind of fools you. You think it's going to be like some, like, oh, man, is New Anthem going to start, like, adopting puppies? Like, it just sounded really, the piano was, like, very Sarah McLachlan-esque. And, uh, and uh, but then there was a shift in the midst of all of it, and, uh, 
we uh, and, and then and you, he got like hit. The dad got hit by the kid, and it was awesome. But anyway, so we are uh, <laughs> we are starting a brand new series. It's called Reaction, and it's on the book of James. James was a very interesting character. If you didn't know, he was the half brother of Jesus. Now you have to ask yourself, what would that be like? Now, interestingly enough for James, uh, through the majority of his life up until Jesus was actually already crucified, he didn't actually believe he was the son of God. You have to wonder what that would be like to have a brother that came to you and just said, hey, guess what, James? I'm God. (laughs) And, And James just, he didn't believe. Until Jesus died, and we see this transformation happen in James' heart, and, and ultimately he, he, he starts testifying and professing this faith, faith and teaching. He was actually one of the first leaders in this new established Christian church, and he's starting to profess and to, to shape and to lead and to guide. And, and ultimately, in the beginning of James chapter 1, where we're, we're gonna, where we're going to be uh, entering into today, James is giving us some information and, and kind of king us in on some things of how ultimately we should handle ourselves when we find ourselves in trial. He's talking to a reader who doesn't have their life completely figured out, who's maybe in the middle of something, who's in the middle of a tension, who's in the middle of a storm, and and ultimately James is wanting to make it abundantly clear about how God feels about people that would find themselves in a trial or in a storm. And so this is an amazing book. And I think this is a really important week for us as we're diving into James 1, because I believe there are people here under the sound of my voice that are maybe in the middle of something themselves. And maybe it is a doctor's report that you received. Maybe it's an unexpected bill that came in the mail. Maybe it's, it's news that they've all, you've ultimately received that has kind of flipped your whole world upside down. Or maybe it's just a trial that, you might, that might even be simple in some respect because you've been dealing it with it for so long and so consistently. And I believe for every single one of us that Jesus wants to speak to that thing today. Jesus wants you to live a life not marked by trial and marked by stronghold and marked by anxiety and marked by the storm that you may be in, but marked by liberty and marked by freedom and ultimately to have you live a life that's marked by the triumph and victory that you can find in Jesus. Amen? And so let's dive into James 1. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there with me now. Or if you are tuned in, you can just go to the Bible Gateway at, or go to the BibleGateway.com or the Bible app and just type in James. We're going to start right in verse 1 of chapter 1, and it reads this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So see it once again, James makes it real easy. What's the key to experiencing life in Christ and being able to triumph in our trials? Well, whatever trial, whatever storm you're in, just be happy. Let's keep going. Verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you, should, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now let's skip down to verse 12. It says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. May God bless the reading of his word today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For these people, we thank you for this moment in time. And we ask uh, right now as we're about to kind of dive into the word of God and kind of take it apart, your word, God, and, and kind of see what it has for us. We give you permission to do the same to us, to open up our hearts, to open up our lives and our minds to get inside and to rearrange some things. I believe that's the work that your Holy Spirit wants to do today. We just surrender. We're going to allow you to do that. Let the word of God speak. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. I want to give you four principles today that will hopefully allow us to learn how to triumph over trial. 
Maybe you're like, man, I, I would love some, love some keys to how to triumph in any kind of trial, in any kind of storm. Let's, let's jump into verse 4. It says this, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, many of us, when we go through a trial or we go through a storm, man, that's all we see. We don't really see anything around us. In fact, a pastoral mentor of mine, he says it this way. A lot of times when he's in a trial, he gets trial tunnel vision, right? Maybe you can relate to that. Like, that's all you see. You don't even see anything else. Maybe that one trial or storm, that thing that you're facing, that splinter in your life or your relationship with Jesus, you keep coming back to it. Or maybe it's that one thing, maybe it's the one thing in your marriage where you're like, if we could just beat this one thing, if we could just get past this one thing, we would have such a beautiful relationship. If I could just establish this one thing, if I could get over or past this storm or this trial in my relationship with God, man, where would I be in my faith? Man, whatever it is for you today, many of us have that one, that, 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 that those couple of things that just seem to be that thing that's in the way from us getting to where we feel God has called us to be, spiritually, relationally, emotionally. Yeah, I began to think of this, and, and maybe, maybe you've been to a concert. I know many of us uh, have, and I remember when we used to go to concerts back then? <laughs> Movies, all those great things. Hopefully we can get back to that soon. Anyways, my wife and I, um, we would go to concerts all the time. I would, uh, took her, was taking her to a, a Need to Breathe concert. It's one of our favorite Christian bands. And we were up at the Royal Oak Music Theater, and uh, we, had, we were there with a couple of friends. And my wife and I, were like concert ninjas, and we always find a way. We, like, we get there early. We're always going to find a way to get to the front, like get up front, and just have like this awesome seat, you know, like where we can like reach out and touch the lead singer's leg. We would never do that. I probably would, but Cece wouldn't want me to. Anyways, so like we always find a way to get right up to the front, and that's what we did. And so it's need to breathe. There's thousands of people in this beautiful theater, and we got like up right to the front in the Center, in the middle, it's awesome. But how many know that who's ever been to a concert that there's also these other people lurking and they came to the concert late and they came late on purpose because they decided, they knew this back when they booked the tickets that when they got to the concert they were going to show up late after everyone already found their spots and then they were going to shove their way up to the front of the stage. And that's what these two gentlemen did. There was a, there was a gentleman, he was pretty tall, he was like six foot and his friend was like 6'11 and he stands right in front of us. And so now this concert that we were super excited to see for months, I am watching now Need to Breathe with special guest, the seven foot Amazonian right in front of me. But the truth today is for many of us, that's what our trials are like. Like things would be absolutely great if there just wasn't this one Thing. I was going along great. I came to this new position, this new place in my life, in my career, in my marriage, in my relationship, and then here comes this storm. And if it wasn't just for this one thing, I would be at such a better place in space. I wonder if you can relate to that today. I believe that Jesus wants to speak to that. But notice what James says. On the other side of the trial and difficulty is maturity and completeness. On the other side of hardship is wisdom. On the other side of this great difficulty is a greater strength and completeness because God is ultimately wanting to shape us into the people he's called us to be. Please don't think for a second that this is, this is something that, oh, man, it's easy for you to say, Pastor John, you don't deal with this kind of thing. I absolutely deal with this kind of thing. And there's been some weight in this last week. I kid you not, Tuesday morning, I'm standing in front of my staff and I'm like, hey, Guys, let's not, let's not uh, t let our guards down. We've just seen God do some amazing things. Uh, we've seen a lot of salvations. We've seen our church grow, and we're about to do night of worship, and I believe that's going to be huge, which means Satan is really, really angry, and I believe that he's about to wage war, and I say this not to scare us, but to prepare us. And sure enough, only a few days later, there's, some, there's been some, some weight and some, some things, some some dynamics that have come to, to me as a pastor, to the, to the staff, to, and, and there's just some things that we're having to walk through. And I say this not to discourage any of us, but to encourage us. Because when we are where Jesus wants us to be, when we're moving in the direction of Jesus, Satan's going to do everything he can do to stop us along the way. And so ultimately, what am I saying here? 
when it comes to our trials, number one, here's point number one. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Point number one is this. We need to begin with the end in mind. We need to begin with the end in mind. This is so huge. This is so critical. We need to begin with the end in mind. This runs in contrast to the tunnel vision that most of us approach our trials and our storms that we enter into with. Because this would say that, that it, would, it would create this moment of awareness and this moment of emotional, maybe spiritual lucidity where we take a second and say, okay, I, I'm shaking. The, the storm's coming. I, I'm feeling it now. I'm in the middle of it. This thing came out of nowhere. It rocked me. But beginning with the end in mind is the awareness to say, no, no, I've been knocked down, but I haven't knocked, been knocked out. And God has more for me, and God's going to move in this because I'm a more, more than a conqueror in Jesus. And the plans that God has for me is to prosper me, not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. And, and there may be weeping for a moment in the evening, but joy is coming in the morning. So to begin with the end in mind is to just take a moment to remember that, that God is good, and God is going to bring me through all the way in, until the end. That's what the end is. The end is Jesus, and the beginning is Jesus, and the middle, well, that's going to be Jesus too. Because he's enough for me, even in the unknown, even in the discomfort. Jesus is enough, and he's going to see me to the end. We need to begin with the end in mind. Many of us, we get so focused on the pain of the present instead of focusing on the freedom of the future. This is really hard for many of us to do, but this was what the great heroes of our faith did all throughout the word of God. In fact, there's a whole chapter dedicated to it in Hebrews. If you read through it, it's called the Hall of Faith chapter, where these great men and women of God were faithful, ultimately clinging to the promise of God, beginning with the end in mind. So we move on to verse 12. It says this, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. Man, I love that. I don't know what the crown of life is, but it sounds awesome. Now, here's all we know about crowns. The Bible says we're going to be collecting them for different work that we did for God here on earth, and then we're going to be throwing them at the feet of Jesus. I, I'd, I'd hope that maybe the crowns had some other kind of use, like maybe one gave you superpowers or something. Like I, either, either way, I want them. I don't know what the crown of life is, but I know I want it. Here is the main point, though. That God has a plan even in the midst of the trial. He's thinking about the end. Here it is. Let's read it again. Blessed is the one who perseveres in trial. This is our moment. This is where we are. Because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life. God has a plan even in the middle of the trial. God, God's, God's thinking about the end. God's thinking about the blessing at the end, even in the midst of the trial that we may be experiencing right here. God has a future for you. God, and it's ultimately to mature you, to complete you, and even at the end of your days, to give you a crown. Let's move on to point number two. Our principle number two is found in verse five. It says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Friends, if we're going to step into what God would have for us, if we're going to learn how to triumph in our trial, we need to learn how to ask for wisdom. We need to learn how to cry out to God and ask for wisdom. Ultimately, every trial we're in should be a catalyst for calling out to God. But many of us, we try to, we try to fix it on our own first, right? Some of us, like, it's the, it's the last thing that we think to do is talk to God. Did I ever tell you all about the time I thought Cece was dead? Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So it's three months after our, our, our wedding day, and uh, I'm like, hey, let's get away. I know we already had our honeymoon, but let's get away. Let's go up to the UP and get a little cabin with some of our, our married couple friends, and, uh, and we'll just have a good weekend. She's like, okay. So we, we show up to the cabin. We're waiting for our pastor friends to arrive, and Cece's like, I'm just going to take a quick nap. And, uh, and I was like, okay, cool. I'm just like I am now, so I don't sleep at all. And so I'm like, I'm going to just like watch TV or something. And so she's like, I mean, they were almost there. She was going to take a nap for like five or six minutes. Now, I knew, knew homegirl could sleep. I didn't know how deep she could sleep. And so she's sleeping five, six minutes, something like that. And, uh, and there's a knock at the door. Our friends arrive. I'm like, oh, i got to wake Cece up. So I, I go over. I'm like, hey, babe, they're here. And I, I kind of start like shaking her like this. And she's like, hey, they, they showed up. They're here. I'm like, oh, okay. It, you know, and, 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 and she's not waking up. She's not waking up. I'm just starting to shake her more and more and more and more and more. And then I had this thought. I'm like, oh, oh, she wants to play. 
Okay, okay. So I just figure, like, she, she's, she's awake, but she's just not really responding to me. Again, we've only been married, like, three months. So I just start, like, bouncing her. It's like this springy futon. She's, like, coming six, eight inches off the futon. And I'm just like, poof, 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 wake up, wake up. And, and, and then finally, on the last bounce, I had this thought that's, my wife's either dead or in a coma. And I just stop bouncing her. And I take a step back, and I'm like, ah! And I just froze for what felt like 20 minutes was probably only 30 seconds. But anyways, I just froze and I'm just, I'm just staring at her and all these thoughts are going through my head and I just went, and then all of a sudden she's like, what? And she just like sits up and like snaps back to life. Did it happen? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm not lying. All this is a true story. And (laughs) do you know, no, at no point, from the time that I thought my wife was uh, only, you know, playing with me to the point that I thought she was dead or in a coma. At no point did I cry out to the God of the universe. Now, this is a true confession from your pastor. At no point did it cross my mind. Now, I understand that it was, it was seven years ago or whatever, but still, I, I, I struggle with the same thing today. Like, like at what point will, will my faith be such where prayer is just like the reflex? Like, that's what I want it to be. I just want it to be a reflex, and there's still way too many times in my own life, in my own walk with Jesus, where I'm like, why did I wait to pray? Like, like God who holds the sun and the moon and the stars in his hand. Like, he, I, I'm going to go to him last. And under my own human, finite brain, I'm going to try to solve any kind of problem here on earth and go to him second. And we, need to, we need to cry, learn to cry out to the God of heaven. Amen? We need to cry out to the God of heaven. And we need to listen to the God of heaven. Because he wants to give us wisdom. You can't live from supernatural wisdom if you aren't listening for supernatural revelation. I'm going to say that again. You can't live from supernatural wisdom if you aren't listening for supernatural revelation. This is exactly what God is wanting to give. He's like, man, you need wisdom? You need wisdom? Well, here's the step-by-step process. Just ask me. Well, and maybe you're here today and you're like, no, I I would, Pastor John, but like, you know, I don't, I don't, I feel like I'm been making some stupid choices lately. Like, I, I haven't been doing the right thing. I'm, I, 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 it's been a long time since I prayed. Like, I, maybe he won't be listening. Isn't this great how James clears this up? He, God, he says, um, no, God does, actually doesn't find fault. He says, finding no fault. God gives generously without finding fault. It means on our worst day, when we're the worst version of ourselves, and we go to God to ask for wi- wisdom, he is waiting to generously give wisdom to his children. And this is good news for all of us. So let's transition to principle number three. It says this in verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Sounds like James is like turning into a Debbie Downer here before our very eyes. Here's what's interesting about James 1. There's, there's um, three words uh, that in the Greek, uh, the word test, trial, and tempt all come from the same Greek root word. And if you didn't know how, how it kind of works is there's a lot of words that are used uh, to mean the same thing. And so it's up to a, a theologian, biblical scholar to, as they're translating it, find the context of what's being talked about in the text to figure out what form of usage that same root word is to be used for. And so this is really important because this helps us realize, watch this, that in any trial that God wants to develop us or train us, Satan, the devil, wants to topple us and tempt us. You following me? So, so track with me this way. Matthew 24, you don't have to, tra- you don't have to uh, uh, flip over to that page, but Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus uh, goes out into the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, he's fasting, and this is where the day- devil comes to tempt him, and he tempts him in every way that ultimately we are to be tempted. But there's an interesting little piece here where it says this in, in, in Matthew chapter 24, the Holy Spirit led Jesus to be tempted. Now, I'm not going to lie, I wrestled with that. Because I know James. I know James 1. I was homeschooled. I had, to, I had to memorize James 1. I know it well. And it says God doesn't tempt anybody. But then here it says the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus to be tempted. What's going on here? 
There's a revelation here that I think will blow your mind in the same way it blew mine. Because when we go back to prophecy in Isaiah, it says that Jesus is actually only Jesus is if he was eventually tempted by the devil. There's actual prophecy that talks about the Son of Man actually being tempted by the devil, which means this prophecy for Jesus to be Jesus eventually had to be fulfilled with his life and time here on earth. What does this mean? It means the Holy Spirit was ultimately leading him to fulfill his prophecy, knowing that that prophecy being fulfilled was him being tempted by the devil. What does this mean for us? It means that maybe we need to flip the flow and change the narrative in our mind. And maybe there's some major temptations that many of us struggle with regularly on a daily basis. But could it be that those areas of temptation are ultimately God saying, hey, hey I, I, I'm going to set you up for something here. And when you, when you step in, into the life that I've called you to live, when you, when you don't fall prey to this temptation, you're going to be stepping into a place and space that I've destined you to live. We see this in the story of Job. Think about it. We see this in the story of Job. Uh, Job, the, one of the only people in the word of God that the Bible says was a man who was sinless, sinless and blameless before the Lord. In all the land, was sinless and blameless before the Lord. And this is who ultimately, all this calamity, all these terrible things, his family members, his own health, um, just being destroyed. Why? Because, well, Satan went to God. And he said, hey, God, he's only worshiping you because of all the stuff that you gave him. Job was a real rich man. He said, all this stuff that you gave him, you take all that away, he won't worship you anymore. God says, consider my servant Job. He, he's, he's not going He's not going to curse my name. How do we know that the same conversations, you see, it's the same God that we read about in the Old Testament is the same God. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the same God that exists today. This is the same God we worship today. How do we know that whatever trial, whatever, whatever kind of situation we're in, isn't a conversation where God has said, hey, consider my servant. Consider my servant. There may be a trial. There may be a temptation. Consider my servant. And when we don't fall prey to that, when we don't bow to the knee of whatever trial that maybe we are facing and we step into and we cling hold of God just like Job did and we cling hold of God and we step into what he has called us to, what are we stepping into? We're stepping into the blessing and the favor of God and the comfort of God. And, and how are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to get it there? Because, that we're, because of our own human strength that whatever temptation we're facing, we're just so strong, we're not going to... No, 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 no. You see... God knows we're weak. God knows we're broken. And that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit of God inside us is what's going to give us the strength to bring us home. To do all of this brings us to principle number three. We need to own our own weakness. To get here, we need to own our own weakness. See, this is tough to hear. Just say it out loud. We need to own our own weakness. Own my own weakness. Yeah. Wives, turn to your husbands. Say, husband, you need to own your own weakness. Husband, turn to your wives. Say, you look beautiful today. Here's the deal. If we don't own our own weakness, you won't do what is necessary to address your own weakness. You'll spend all your time pointing fingers and blaming everyone for everything in your life. Well, this is why I'm the way I am, because of this or because of this or because of this. If we own our own weakness and own the fact that we're broken, now God can do something with that. Now we can allow the Holy Spirit of God to start changing things and rearranging things, just like we talked about in the beginning of service. And maybe for you, exactly what you need is, is, is something that, that can't just happen in a prayer. Maybe you need to go to counseling. Maybe it's marriage counseling. Maybe you need an accountability partner. Do you know I have like seven, eight accountability partners? And I go to counseling. Why? Because I'm messed up and broken. And I'm imperfect and I need Jesus. And I have a broken, busted past. And I want to be a good leader. And I want to have a healthy marriage. We got to own your own weakness. Do you see that? you got to own your own weakness. That doesn't come from a place of strength. That's understanding the fact that I'm not strong. But that God in me can make a difference. But i got to own my own weakness to step into what God has for you. Our final principle this morning comes from verse 17. It says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, 
who does not change like shifting shadows. We need to always remember this. If we're going to triumph in the trial, remember this, church, that God is unchanging. That God is unchanging and unwavering. He's not like your earthly relationships. See, many of us project and manifest our, our issues and our earthly relationships on the God of the universe. And so the breakdowns of trust that we've had in relationships, those that were closest to us, those people that were supposed to love us, that there was a breakdown in trust, that has now become a tension and an issue. We project that on the God of heaven and say, well, I don't know if I can trust God, though. I don't know if I can trust God. I don't know if he's going to come through for me. Well, I know his love is true. I know his, his love never fails, but I, I'm just having a hard time because uh, everything that I've experienced... Everything I've experienced with the tangible, not the supernatural. This is God we're talking about. We have to remember he is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's easy to remember that when things are good, right? It's easy when there's, there's blessing and there's more than enough in the bank account and there's a roof over our heads and, and all the bills are paid and there's, there's, there's just really nothing crazy. And God has us in a kind of a mountaintop season where there's just kind of a good rhythm to our life. It's a lot harder when the trial comes and the storm comes. You need to understand that eventually it's just going to be your turn again. You know what I mean by that? Like eventually, it's just going to be your turn. Eventually, we're just going to get the doctor's notice. Eventually, there's going to be a death or an ailment or there's going to be some bill. There's, always, there's just going to be something. Because God doesn't promise us this abounding comfort in life. In fact, he promises us through James that there's going to be trial and there's going to be storm. But the beauty of that promise is that we are also promised that for those of us that are in Christ, that he is going to be right there with us in the middle of it. It's interesting because when we talk about Jesus, it's many times we, he can feel so far away that he doesn't understand our trial, doesn't understand our problem. When, when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about a person, a God who put on skin and bone and walks, walked amongst us and ultimately um, experienced the most intense trial that any person ever could or ever should. You see, because on the cross, he wasn't just experiencing physical pain. He wasn't just experiencing emotional pain. He was experiencing spiritual pain because he was bearing the weight of all of our sins, of your sins, of my sins, for all time, for all existence. And he was bearing the weight of all of that. And I, and I wonder, man, what, 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 could, what could possess a man to try to endure, to hold on to all of that? The Bible says that, that Jesus could have just called down legions of angels to rescue him, to, to save him, to deliver him from that moment, and yet he endured. What would cause a man to do that? Well, uh, Psalm 16 is going to give us a clue, and this is the words of Jesus. It starts in verse 8, and it says this, I keep my eyes always on you, Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You, may, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Here Jesus is. He's on a cross. He's falsely accused, and he's bearing the weight of all of our sin. How is he able to get to it and able to get through it? Because he was remembering the faithfulness of God, even in the darkest moment. And this is a key to life, and this is a key to triumph, finding triumph in trial. You see, it doesn't matter what season you are in what your trial may look like. There isn't varsity and junior varsity trials or storms. And even the things that may even seem insignificant to you, it's all important to Jesus. And he wants to speak to all of it today. Let's just bow our heads in this place this morning. Perhaps you were in the middle of a emotional, marital, relational, financial storm today. You don't see the end. You don't see the light at the end. Would you allow the spirit of God to just invade that place? Would you surrender that thing that you've been holding on so tightly to? I know it feels good to have a sense of control, but it's only when we let go of that thing that God can be the difference maker. 
And maybe you're here today and you're in the middle of a trial and a storm. And that's really been the, the song and of really your whole life has just been storm and trial, storm after storm. And maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you want to become a follower of Jesus. Follow Jesus with your whole life. You know you can start that today. Like we said, you don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to try to make yourself right. There's those that would try to say that. Maybe there's those that have believed that. But that's not the truth of the gospel. The gospel wants you just as you are. Jesus says, just as you are, broken, bruised, a broken past, suffering from consequences from your past mistakes. I want that version of you because God, friend, is not in love with some future version of you. He's in love with you, and he wants a relationship with you. And so maybe you want to make that first-time decision to follow Jesus. On the count of three, if that's you, I'm going to ask that you just lift your hand in the air so we can recognize you. If you're tuned in right now, I'm going to ask that you just say yes right in the chat there, the comment section either below or to the right of your screen. So for everyone in the house, you say, I want a relationship with Jesus. Just on the count of three, lift your hand in the air. One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you, just lift your hand in the air. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. God sees that hand. God sees that hand. It's amazing. Best decision you could ever make. We see you online as well. We're going to ask that you just leave. We just want to follow in this prayer along with us for everyone that rose their hand, but also for anyone else that's in the house today. Just pray this prayer out loud. Just say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate with those, all those that made first-time decisions? It's amazing. Greatest decision you could ever make. You weren't here by accident, friend. You weren't here by accident, but by divine appointment. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I believe the church was created to be a part of that. The church exists for broken people like every single one of us to learn more about a perfect Savior. And so we're excited for you to start that journey with you. If you made that first-time decision, we have a free Bible we want to give you at Connection Point, as well as some other information. If you are a brand-new person uh, with us, we'd love you to turn in your Connect card as well. And uh, we have a free gift for you. And so we're so blessed that you joined us today. We're going to actually end in a time of worship because we're celebrating. Many of us, we need to remember this, many of us stay in the trial. We stay in the trial part of life. And many of us are kind of stuck there. We're in this, we're in this like trial cyclone. We just kind of bounce from trial to trial. You know that God is wanting us to move from trial to victory. And are, are having our lives lived and marked by victory in Jesus. And that's a reason to celebrate. And so whether you made a first time decision, you've been following Jesus for life, I'm going to ask we just like stand to our feet as we celebrate Jesus this morning. Hey, thank you so much for checking out New Anthem Church's YouTube channel. It is our heart and our prayer that this message would be encouraging and impactful for you. If you enjoyed this video, we have tons just like it already on our channel. And we would encourage you to hit the subscribe button either down below or right over here. That way you can stay up to date on when we post the messages. Now, if you don't want to wait for them to come out, we do live stream at 11 a.m. every single Sunday on Facebook at My New Anthem Church. Now here at New Anthem, our vision is so simple. We want to experience Jesus, we want to equip his people, and we want to empower the world. So with that, we want to say we love you and God bless.